Hey folks, in this video we're going to look at determinants of matrices. This is my third video on determinants and builds upon the prior two. If you haven't seen those, be sure to check them out. In the first video we learned that historically determinants were actually discovered long before matrices in connection with systems of equations, though there's a close connection between the two concepts today. From a modern geometrical point of view, we saw that determinants measure n-dimensional oriented volume, at least over the real numbers, although this intuition is still useful in guiding us to correct results in more general cases. The algebraic properties of determinants were seen to follow from the geometrical properties with this point of view. In the second video, we saw that the determinant of a linear map is just the factor by which it scales volume. In this video, we build upon what we've done to define the determinant of a matrix. To do this, we first recall that matrices represent linear maps. I assume you're probably already familiar with this fact from linear algebra, but we'll review it briefly in a moment. We'll see that the determinant of a matrix is just the determinant of the linear map it represents. Let's get started and dive into the details. Let A be an n by n matrix over the field F. Then A induces a linear map phi A on Fn through multiplication. Here x denotes an n by 1 column vector in Fn, and phi A of x is A times x, the result of multiplying A by x using ordinary matrix multiplication. The observation here is just that matrix multiplication is linear. Conversely, let phi on Fn be an arbitrary linear map. Recall that a linear map is completely determined by its action on a basis. We write phi Ej as the sum, for i from 1 to n, of alpha ij ei, where the e's are the standard basis vectors in Fn. Then phi induces the n by n matrix A phi consisting of the alphas, seen here. This matrix captures or encodes all the information about phi. Notice that for an entry alpha in the matrix, the first number in the subscript of alpha indicates the row position, while the second number in the subscript indicates the column position. So alpha ij is the entry in row i column j, whereas alpha ji is the entry in row j column i. Importantly, the maps sending a matrix to its linear map and sending a linear map to its matrix are mutually inverse. In fact, the maps are isomorphisms between the ring of n by n matrices over f and the ring of linear maps on fn. For this reason, we say that the matrix A represents the linear map phi A, and the two are essentially interchangeable. This naturally leads us to our definition of the determinant of a matrix. The determinant of an n by n matrix A is just the determinant of the linear map phi A it represents. If A has entries alpha ij, the determinant is conventionally written with vertical bars like this. It's also standard practice to abuse language and speak of the rows and columns of the determinant, even though, technically speaking, the determinant is just a scalar. This can be understood to mean the rows and columns of the matrix. Intuitively, from what we already know about determinants of linear maps, this definition tells us that det A is just the factor by which A scales n-dimensional oriented volume when viewed as a linear map. Using this definition, we can easily establish properties of determinants of matrices from known properties of determinants of linear maps. For example, consider the fundamental product rule. The determinant of the product of two square matrices A and B is just the product of their determinants. For the proof, we just observe that det AB equals det phi AB by definition, which equals det phi A phi B because of the isomorphism between matrices and linear maps, which equals det phi A times det phi B by the product rule for determinants of linear maps, which equals det A times det B by definition. Note this proof requires no computation with the elements of the matrices. We can similarly establish other important properties of determinants of matrices. For example, a matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero. If a matrix is invertible, then the determinant of its inverse is the inverse of its determinant. The determinant of a matrix is equal to the determinant of its transpose, and the determinant of a block upper triangular matrix is just the product of the determinants of the blocks. Here A1 and A2 are square submatrices on the diagonal of the matrix, with zeros below them and arbitrary elements above them. 
A similar result holds for more than two blocks. All of these properties can be proved from the properties of determinants of linear maps which were established in the last video. It's worth pausing the video and doing this. None of the proofs require computation. We'll make use of these properties throughout this video. Again, let A be an n by n matrix over F. There's another important interpretation of the determinant of A. To see this, let delta be the determinant function on Fn with delta of E1 through En equal to 1. As before, the E's are just the standard basis vectors in Fn. Then from the definition of the determinant of a linear map, we know that det A equals delta of AE1 through AEN. But AE1 through AEN are just the columns of A. So this shows that det can be viewed as a determinant function in the columns of a matrix. That is, det is a multilinear and alternating function in the columns. Duly, since the determinant of a matrix is equal to the determinant of its transpose, it follows that det can also be viewed as a determinant function in the rows of a matrix. This provides a different perspective. Rather than viewing a matrix as a linear map, we can also view it as a collection of column or row vectors, and the determinant tells us about these vectors. Intuitively, det A is the n-dimensional oriented volume of the parallelopiped formed by the column vectors, or row vectors, of A. While the columns and rows in general form different parallelopipeds, the parallelopipeds always have the same volume. A number of important properties follow from these observations. For example, the determinant is linear in each column and row. The determinant is unchanged if a linear combination of other columns is added to a given column, and similarly for rows. The determinant changes sign if two columns or rows are interchanged. And the determinant is non-zero if and only if the columns and rows are linearly independent. In particular, the determinant is zero whenever a single column or row consists entirely of zeros, and whenever two columns or rows are equal. These properties are intuitive geometrically from the interpretation of the determinant just given, and they're also useful computationally. For example, one strategy to compute a determinant is to reduce it through row and column operations into a form that's easier to compute. Since it's known how the determinant changes under each such operation, it's possible to recover the original determinant. Of course, practically speaking, if you actually need to compute a determinant these days, you'll just plug it into a computer. We can also obtain explicit formulas for the determinant. If A has entries alpha ij, then det A equals delta of the sums seen here, which are just the row vectors of A. By reasoning as we did in the first video using the properties of the determinant function delta, we obtain the sum seen here. Recall that Sn denotes the set of permutations or rearrangements of the numbers 1 to n, so the sum extends over all such permutations sigma. The factor minus 1 to the sigma is the sine of sigma, plus 1 if sigma makes an even number of transpositions, and minus 1 if sigma makes an odd number of transpositions. Of course, this is just the Leibniz expansion of an n by n determinant, as we saw in the first video. When n equals 2, the expansion looks like this, with two terms. As n increases, the number n factorial of terms in the expansion quickly gets huge. This combinatorial complexity is one reason why many linear algebra books warn that determinantal methods are impractical for solving problems in higher dimensions. While there's truth to that, it also depends on the algorithm used to compute the determinant. If you use the worst possible naive algorithm, it will be really inefficient. But if you use other techniques, like row and column reduction, or matrix decompositions, you can do much better. That said, there are usually even better techniques that avoid determinants altogether, so it's best to view the determinant as a primarily theoretical device. The Laplace expansion expresses a determinant in terms of smaller determinants. More specifically, it expresses an n plus 1 by n plus 1 determinant in terms of n by n determinants derived from the original determinant. For example, this is the expansion of a 3 by 3 determinant along the first column. Notice that the elements in the first column, that is, alpha 1 1, alpha 2 1, and alpha 3 1, appear as coefficients of the 2 by 2 determinants on the right-hand side, with a minus sign in front of alpha 2 1. 
Notice also that each of the 2x2 determinants is obtained from the original 3x3 determinant by deleting the row and column in which its coefficient appears. For example, the first 2x2 determinant is obtained by deleting the first row and first column of the 3x3 determinant. This expansion is based on a fundamental relationship between n-dimensional volume and n plus 1-dimensional volume, which I covered in detail in my first video. It can also be derived using the adjoint, which I introduced in the last video. Let's take a look at that derivation now. Let adj a, with entries beta ij, be the matrix of the adjoint transformation of phi a. This matrix is called the adjoint of a. Then from the formula for the adjoint which we saw in the last video, and the isomorphism between matrices and linear maps, we know that adj a of ej must equal the sum seen here, where ej appears in the ith position of delta. This immediately tells us that beta ij is the determinant seen here. Don't be alarmed, this looks more complicated than it is. This is just the determinant of the matrix obtained from A by replacing the ith column with the column vector ej. That is, the ith column consists of zeros except for a 1 in the jth row. Now, we can move the ith column over to be the first column by repeatedly interchanging it with the i-1 columns to its left. And then we can move the 1 in the jth row up to the first row by repeatedly interchanging the jth row with the j-1 rows above it. Since we know that the determinant changes sign with each interchange, this tells us that beta ij equals minus 1 to the i plus j times the resulting determinant seen here. But this determinant has a special form. It's block upper triangular, with a 1 by 1 block in the upper left corner containing the single value 1, and an n-1 by n-1 block in the lower right corner, which is just the matrix obtained from A by deleting the jth row and ith column. It therefore follows from the theorem we saw earlier about block upper triangular determinants, that beta ij equals minus 1 to the i plus j times aji, where aji is the determinant of the matrix obtained from A by deleting the jth row and ith column. aji is called a minor of A and minus 1 to the i plus j times aji is called a cofactor of a. The result we just established is that the adjoint matrix is the transpose of the cofactor matrix. Now, from the fundamental theorem about the adjoint which we proved in the last video, we know that the determinant of a times the n by n identity matrix equals the adjoint of a times a. This means that the entry in the ith row and kth column of both of these product matrices is the same which is captured by this equation. Here delta ik is the Kronecker delta, which is 1 when i equals k, and 0 otherwise. Taking i equal to k and using what we just established about the adjoint matrix, we obtain an expansion for the determinant of a. This is the Laplace expansion along the ith column of a. Isn't that slick? Substituting a transpose for a gives a dual expansion along the ith row of a. In addition to providing a way to compute the determinant, this also provides a way to compute the inverse of a matrix. If A is invertible, then we know from the last video that A inverse is just the adjoint of A over the determinant of A. For example, the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix is given by this formula, which you've probably seen before. Miners have other important applications in determinant theory. To see this, we need a more general notion of minor. Let i and j be subsets of 1 to n of the same size k. Let a i j denote the determinant of the k by k submatrix of A with rows from i and columns from j. For example, if n equals 3, i consists of the numbers 1 and 3, and j consists of the numbers 2 and 3, then we have this. I recommend pausing the video to make sure you understand what's going on in this example. a i j is called a minor of a of order k. Notice how we previously formed minors by deleting or rejecting certain rows and columns from the original matrix, whereas now we're forming minors by retaining certain rows and columns. These minors are sometimes called retainer minors, while the others are called rejector minors, although clearly everything can be described in terms of either rejection or retention. Minors can also be defined more generally for m by n matrices, where m is not necessarily equal to n. 
In this case, i is a subset of 1 to m, while j is a subset of 1 to n, but i and j must still have the same size. In the language of matrices, the theorem from the last video providing a determinantal characterization of rank just says that the rank of a matrix is the largest order among its non-zero minors. This statement of the theorem is actually more elegant than the one in the last video, because with a matrix, we've already got the coordinates, so we don't need extra machinery to introduce a coordinate system. Another strikingly beautiful theorem involving minors is the generalized Cauchy-Binet theorem, which expresses each minor of a product of two matrices as a sum of products of minors of those matrices. The sum here extends over all subsets k of 1 to n, which have the same size as i and j. Notice this theorem yields the ordinary rule for matrix multiplication when i and j have size 1, and yields the product rule for determinants when a and b are both n by n matrices and i and j have size n. This theorem has an even more elegant statement in the language of exterior algebra, but that's a topic for another time. There's always more to say about determinants. In future videos, I may say more. If you like these videos, be sure to let me know in the comments and subscribe. Here are the references I used while making this video. Thanks for watching.